everybody. We are going to critically discuss the concept of civilization and look at some of the ways in which archaeologists have tried to quantify and classify what constitutes a state level complex society. So there's kind of five main criteria that archaeologists usually apply in defining civilizations. First, economies based on the centralized accumulation of capital and social status through tribute and taxation. Economies that allow for the support of hundreds of thousands of non-food producing people. There's also an important component of long distance trade within these complex societies and a division of labor that allows for things like craft specialization. Another key component in how we might measure or define complex civilizations is advances towards formal record keeping, science and mathematics along with a form of written script. These advances took on many forms, including the knotted strings called a quipu used by Incas in the Andes. And we'll talk about this more in module five. We also see large scale cities and monumental architecture being associated with these more hierarchical and complex type of state level societies. So you can think about all those Roman, iconic Roman temples, uh, like the Colosseum that we see here behind me. There's also the factor of religion. As we've been talking about over the past couple modules, human societies gradually developed more and more complex and diverse forms of thinking about the world and dealing with the afterlife. So in these complex societies, we often see a kind of all embracing state religion in which the ruler or king plays a leading role. So for example, you can think about the Khmer of C Cambodia who considered their leaders as living gods. These sorts of royal, these sorts of royalty fueled the creation of monumental forms of architecture and the use of writing and symbolic systems to, uh, to reinforce their power. What's important to recognize about all of these criteria, architecture, writing, uh, hierarchical economies, the presence of religion, is that these criteria that archeologists typically use are historically situated. It was really only during the 16th century that Europeans began to develop this kind of modern concept of civilization that we have today. As Westerners began exploring Africa, the Caribbean, and North and South America, they came into contact with people who looked and acted very different from themselves. In anthropological terms, these people are called cultural others. As Europeans became aware of an increasing number of cultures, they began to classify them, dividing them into groups based on various physical features and social institutions. These kind of criteria for these categories that early European explorers and colonizers were using reflect a culturally situated value judgment, often called ethnocentrism. So there was two implicit moral evaluations that came with this classificatory scheme. One, modern societies were evaluated by what they had gained and primitive societies were evaluated by what they lack. So these definitions of civilization are based on a comparative and a subtractive process. 
So for example, you see with these quote unquote primitive societies, which Europeans used to classify uh, people living in Africa, as well as particularly in Australia and the Americas, these societies were based on a subtractive process in which you looked at the fact that these societies lacked sedentism, they lacked property or the presence of a delayed return economy, they lacked leaders, and there was a lack of status differences in terms of age or gender. All of these apparent absences were based on the subjective judgment of European colonizers, rather than necessarily on how those societies viewed themselves or their social systems. With the advent of modern anthropology during the 18th century, European classifications were given the weight of scientific fact. 19th century anthropologists and archaeologists would work backwards from the present in order to reconstruct the evolution of human society. Basically, the idea was that Western civilization was modern and everyone else was primitive. Following the logic of kind of evolution, more primitive societies represented an earlier iteration of Western society. So what we see is a kind of reverse pyramid in which hunter-gatherer societies were seen as living in kind of Paleolithic poverty. Uh, equivalent to what we've been talking about in Module 3 with uh, Neanderthals and uh, Paleolithic Homo sapiens. As we move through time, societies gained sedentism and property with the development of agriculture. As they developed more and more uh, delayed return economies and more kind of hierarchical social systems, we see the emergence of kind of hereditary leadership and divine kingship. This continues in terms of the proliferation of economic specialization and the diversification of the types of jobs people were doing within these ever-growing urban centers until eventually we reach the modern day and we have things like Wall Street, the military industrial complex, uh, globalization, the internet, all sorts of things that make our society very complex today. So while archaeologists have tried to get away from these kind of hierarchical and lineal models of social evolution, the resulting list of traits associated with civilizations remains firmly rooted in European values and ideas. So there are several approaches archaeologists have drawn upon to explain why we see the development of things like monumental architecture, writing, and religion. And that's what we'll talk about for the rest of this lecture. So the first set of theories are ecological in nature. So there's a kind of basic idea here that the ecological potential of river floodplains was critical to the development of state level societies. So think about places like ancient Egypt, uh, like Nubia, uh, like um, ancient China, all of these places that we think of as having complex civilizations. So the argument here is that there was kind of exceptional fertility in the Mesopotamian floodplain and Nile Valley in particular, and that this was the primary cause for the appearance of urban centers and states within these particular regions. This unique ecology facilitated the development of agriculture and the production of larger grain surpluses and social cultural changes associated with that shift from hunting and gathering to agricultural efficiency. So all of this extra food was needed to support a growing number of non-food producers, such as artisans, priests, traders, and new classes of society, which were central to the state organized system. For example, administrative record keepers. The other core part of these ecological theories is that 
there was a diversity of the local environments that we see these major city-states emerging in. So the argument here is that the earliest civilizations were based on complex subsistence patterns that integrated multiple different ecological zones, resulting in a diversity of food resources that protected people against famine and stimulated trade for food and other products abroad. This kind of complex integrative subsistence system also was linked to the growth of a distributive set of organizations that encouraged a centralized authority and a series of subsidiary organizations tasked with redistributing essential foodstuffs and access to natural resources like water. But of course, ecology wasn't the only component uh, within this kind of emergence of state level societies. In addition to ecological theories for the development of civilization, technology and trade is viewed as playing an important role. Specifically in terms of technology, the argument here is that the origins of complex society was li linked to technological innovation and increase in trade in raw materials Things like obsidian, which is a black uh, type of stone that's used to produce stone tools, copper, as well as other luxury goods. Technology evolved in response to these developing trade markets and new demands that expanded the needs of a small segment of the population, specifically a growing number of elites. The other side of this kind of a trade technology equation, right, is the development of local communities that exchanged basic commodities on an increasing scale. Particularly the exchange of luxury goods was important because elites used these prestigious goods to maintain and reinforce their status and power. One uh, example of this kind of trade technology feedback loop is a exchange theory proposed by William Rathje, who basically argued that lowland that the lowland Maya environment was originally deficit in vital resources, things like salt, uh, stones for maize grinding, or obsidian to make stone tools. These goods could only be obtained by nearby highlands, highlanders from the Valley of Mexico and from other regions through trade networks. Such trade networks couldn't be maintained and organized by individual villages alone who all suffered from a similar resource deficiency. As a result, long distance trade networks organized through local ceremonial centers and leaders developed. Over time, these networks organized by ceremonial centers and leaders became the major states that make up the Mayan empire. So now that we know much more about ancient commerce, we know that trade can't be seen as a primary driver of civilization because no one aspect of this process has an overriding causal effect on culture change. Instead, we have this kind of many and ever-changing set of variables that affected ancient trade, including things like demand for goods based on local needs, the logistics of transportation, the extent of the network, as well as the social and political environment in which trade was taking place. Therefore, we would view extensive long distance trade and the types of technological advances it spurred as a consequence rather than a cause of the development of complex state level societies. Another competing theory for why we see the development of complex states has been developed by Robert Carnero. Carnero argued that the amount of agricultural land in the coastal valley of Peru was limited. And as a result of this limited desirable land, it led to a series of kind of predictable events 
that catalyzed the development of the state. So Canero's theory is referred to as the coercive theory. So according to Canero, the first thing that we see in the Incan context is the fl fluorescence of autonomous farming villages linked to the development of agriculture. As populations grew around these agricultural settlements and more land was taken up for crops, communities started fighting over the land and raided each other's fields. So they were competing for these limited types of agricultural lands. During these increasing skirmishes, leaders emerged as successful warlords and became chieftains that presided over these larger polities. As the population continued to grow, warfare also intensified until the entire region fell under a single successful warrior. This ambitious ruler expanded their scope, eventually leading to the growth of a multi-valley state, the Incan Empire. So today, most archeologists agree that the emergence of early civilizations was a gradual process which occurred during a period of major social and economic change, similar to what's described in Canero's coercive theory. And that singular explanations like trade or irrigation or warfare are largely inadequate for explaining the development of these complex states in multiple different parts of the world around about the same time. Recent theories based on systems model draw on complex interactions between these different factors to help explain why we see the development of states. These models are complex because they have to distinguish between mechanisms of culture change as well as environmental pressures. So a key figure in these sorts of cultural systems approach is Robert Adams, who worked on Mesopotamian civilizations. So what you're looking at is a time series map here depicting the formation of the Arabian Gulf through the end of the last ice age with the green dots representing archeological sites. So according to Adams, basically between 7,000 and 6,000 BC, Mesopotamia had regular rainfall and a very reliable climate. It had rising sea levels, which created a very marshy environment that was advantageous for agriculture. Around 5000 BC, the climate becomes drier, sea level rise slows, and the floodplains in Mesopotamia, think primarily Iraq and the Middle East, begin to expand. During this time, some groups of hunter-gatherers turn to irrigation farming, providing higher and higher crop yields in the form of a delayed return economy like we talked about in lecture 3.3. The creation of food surplus and the emergence of a stratified society were an important next step in this process. Irrigation agriculture could feed a bigger population than individual sorts of horticultural plots. Larger populations led to an increase in permanent settlement and trade with regular centers for redistributing goods, which created pressure to increase production and surplus. This process of accumulation was actively fostered by the dominant group in society. Enlarged surpluses allowed people in power to employ more artisans and other specialists on their behalf. What you see behind me here is an image of the UN projection of human population growth uh, since 1800. The current estimate by the UN is that in order to keep pace with population growth, the current rate of food production will have to double by 2050. 
So you can imagine this current trend as, as actually going back much further in time to the 7,000, 6,000, 5,000 BC, where we begin to see the increasing uh, accumulation of people into urban centers, which increases the total population. So this increase in population creates competition for food resources uh, that was heightened, a competition that was heightened by a decrease in arable land as the sea levels were continuing to rise. So communities living near the water's edge likely had to move at regular intervals, eventually coalescing into larger villages. These small villages became towns and then cities, which were central places for political and economic dealings. And thus we see the birth of Mesopotamia civilization. So the creation of food surplus and the emergence of a stratified society were really important here. Uh, and you can see this uh, kind of evolution according to Adam's model through the next couple of slides here. Eventually, the higher population within these Mesopotamian cities led to monopolies over strategic resources, and these communities became more powerful than their neighbors and expanded their territory through military campaigns. Such cities became early centers of major religious activities, as well as technological and artistic innovation. More recently, archeologists have scrapped systems approaches, um, as well as these kind of singular explanations for the development of the state, and really have become more concerned with individuals and groups. These hypotheses revolve around state dynamics and are concerned with economic, ideological, and political power. So the first of these social theories, focusing on economic power, looks at the idea that economic power is based on the ability to organize more specialized production and different tasks involved in food storage and distribution. In early states, there was a transition away from kin-based organization into more centralized structures. Economic power also rested in trade and long-distance exchange networks, which provided access to commodities not locally available. Think about the Rathji's Maya example. So accessing exotic goods required organization, record keeping, and supervision. All of these things are associated with those markers of civilization, right? Writing, we see the development of hierarchy and uh, monumental architecture associated with these reorganization centers. In terms of ideological power, we want to think here about the development and maintenance of a stratified society and its ideology. Ideological power comes from the creation and modification of certain shared cultural and political symbols. Common ideologies create important connections that transcend kinship, our direct uh, genetic relationship. And the guardian of these ideologies were provided with high status in society. So think back to what we were talking about with David Lewis Williams' ideas about the shaman and how the shaman would control access to certain spaces as well as knowledge about the afterworld. So one example that you can see behind me here is Teotihuacan in Mexico, which had a powerful uh, priesthood and a set of religious institutions that created ornate public monuments like the one behind me. Finally, political power. Political power was based on a ruler's ability to impose authority through administrative and military means. Political power was based on foreign relations and its defense of the polity. 
and operated across the state by dealing with major disputes between different factions of society. So all of these social theories, economic, ideological, and political power, draw attention to the important role of individual actors in facilitating and executing these kind of core features of state-level civilizations. <laughs>